In this video, I'm going to show you how to build IoT applications using Windows 10 IoT Core and the Raspberry Pi. I'm Kutzai Mandi Teresa with Industry40.tv and I regularly publish Internet of Things tutorials on this channel. So if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the videos. So here what we've got is our main development kit which is the Raspberry Pi. We're going to be using the Raspberry Pi to develop our IoT applications. So what we're going to do is we're going to flash Windows 10 IoT Core operating system onto the SD card on this Raspberry Pi board. So as you will notice here, my Raspberry Pi is strapped to the back of a touch screen, a 7 inch touch screen, which is the official Raspberry Pi display. So what we're going to do is we'll be building HMI interfaces through which the operator will be able to configure the system and also monitor the parameters that are being read by our IoT application. The operator will also be able to view reports of the data that is being stored in this IoT application. And the next thing that I have here is the load cell. So we're going to be using our IoT application to read the weight from this load cell. And to do that, we're going to be using this tiny module here, which is the HX711. So what it does basically, it converts the voltage signal coming from this load cell and makes it available to our IoT application via a serial interface on one of these pins. And then the next thing that I have is this sensor. So here we're going to be reading the temperature and humidity data from this sensor into our application. And then here I've got a weighing indicator, which is a pretty common in industrial weighing applications. So what we're going to be doing here is we'll be reading the data from this indicator via its RS-232 port. And to do that, we're going to be using this max 3232 level converter so what this does basically it converts the 3.3 volts coming from the raspberry pi serial port to the 5 volts on this weighing indicator serial port and then we will also be reading data from this plc using the modbus tcp and then i've got my breadboard here connecting wires resistors and leds for building the circuits that I'm going to be demonstrating. And then this here is my weight that we're going to be using to calibrate our load cell. I'm going to show you how to download and install Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard that will use to flash your micro SD card with Windows 10 IoT Core operating system. And I'll also show you how to download and install Visual Studio 2019 that we'll be using for developing software for our IoT solution, deploying it to our IoT code device and debugging the solution. And lastly, I will show you how to download the software for formatting your SD card before you can flash it with Windows 10 IoT Core as recommended by Microsoft. So to download Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard, we must go to windowsondevices.com So that will resolve to this URL here. So from here we go to downloads. And then we can click download the Windows 10 RT Core dashboard. When the download is complete, you can navigate to your setup file. And then you can run the setup file and follow the instructions to install the software. So I already have Windows 10 IoT Code Dashboard installed on my machine, but it should be a fairly simple process for you to do. So when your Windows 10 IoT Code Dashboard is finished downloading, we can open it. So this is what your Windows 10 IoT Core Dashboard would look like. So now if you've got devices that you've already 
flashed with Windows 10 IoT core operating system and they are on the same network as your PC, you should be able to see a list of devices here under the My Devices tab. And then you can also set up a new device by going to Set up a new device tab, which we're going to go through in the next video. You can also connect your device to Azure Cloud straight from your IoT Core dashboard. And you can also try out some samples that are available for you to deploy. Okay, so that's it for downloading and installing our Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard. Now let's go ahead and download Visual Studio. Now to download Visual Studio, you go to Visual Studio to Microsoft.com. And then you can go here where it says download Visual Studio. You can select Community Edition 2019. And then an installer will be downloaded so you can go ahead and run that executable. So I've already got Visual Studio installed on my machine. So here I want to show you what options to select when you are installing Visual Studio so that you'll be able to develop applications for Windows 10 IoT Core. Click continue. So when your Visual Studio installer is finished setting up, you will be presented with options where you have to select which workloads you want installed with your Visual Studio IDE. So in our case, we want to be building universal Windows platform applications. So it is mandatory that we check this box here. And that is all that we need for this course. But if you're going to be using Visual Studio, so once you have got your universal Windows platform option selected, you can go ahead and click install. I'm not going to do that because I already have got Visual Studio installed. But once you click install, you're going to be taken through a very straightforward installation process. And then when your Visual Studio is finished installing, you can go ahead and open it. And then when your Visual Studio is open, you're going to see an interface like this. And if you want to create a project, you can just go to create a project. And then because we're going to be creating a UWP application to run on our Windows 10 IoT Core operating system, we need to select a blank universal Windows C Sharp app. We select it and then we click next. Give your app a name and then click create. Okay. Okay, so once the project creation is complete, you will then be presented with a blank universal Windows platform app that you can then go on to use to build your IoT application targeting your Windows 10 IoT Core device. Okay, so we've got our Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard and you've also got our Visual Studio IDE. Now what we need to do is to download the software that we're going to use to flash our Raspberry Pi SD card with the Windows 10 IoT Core operating system. And to do that, we go to sdcard.org. Go to downloads. And then select SD memory card formatter for Windows download. And then scroll down. Click accept. Once you do that, your software will be downloaded in the form of a zipped folder. 
Now when your download is complete, just navigate to the zipped folder, extract it and run the setup file, follow the on-screen instructions and then it should be a fairly simple process to install the SD card formatter software. Now we've got all the software that we need to start building our IoT application. I'm going to show you how to install Windows 10 IoT Core Operating System onto your Raspberry Pi micro SD card. Now, to do that, you must first insert your SD card onto your PC. Once you have done that, you must then start your SD card formatter software. And then when your SD card formatter software is open, you need to select your card, the drive of your card. You can leave here as quick format and then just click format. Okay, so formatting was successfully completed. Now your SD card is ready to be flashed with Windows 10 IoT Core operating system. And to do that, we must open your Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard. And then when your Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard is open, you go to set up a new device. And then under device type, you select Raspberry Pi 2 and 3. And then you can leave the OS build as default. And then here under drive, you need to select the drive of your SD card. And then you need to, to give your Raspberry Pi a name. And then enter a password for your device. Now make sure that you remember this password as it is the password that you're going to use to log into your device portal to configure your operating system. Now once you have entered all of this information, you can go ahead and accept the software license terms. And then you can click download and install. Continue. So your Windows 10 IoT Core dashboard will go through the process of downloading Windows 10 IoT Core first. And then after that is complete, it will unpack the installer and flash it onto your SD card. Okay, so the flashing of the Windows 10 IoT Core operating system is complete and your SD card is ready. But what you'll notice is that you'll get a prompt asking you to format a certain partition of the drive. So you just need to cancel this. And then you can eject your SD card. Okay, now let's head over to our Raspberry Pi and boot it up using our SD card. Okay, so I've uh, inserted my SD card onto the Raspberry Pi and then I've powered up the Raspberry Pi and the display connected an Ethernet cable uh, so that my Raspberry Pi is on the same network as my PC and then make sure your display is securely connected to your Raspberry Pi using this ribbon cable here. So I'll switch on the power. And then if you turn the screen around, you can actually see your operating system booting there. And then you'll get your welcome screen. So it's going to take some time, especially if it's booting for the first time. And then you can choose your language and click next. And then next again, 
accept and then if you want to connect to your Wi-Fi network you can go ahead and do that I'll just skip this step and now as you can see our Windows 10 RIT core operating system is successfully booted on the Raspberry Pi so what you see here is that you've got your device name here the type of network that you're connected to you've got your IP address and then we also have got the operating system version now let's head over to our PC and log into our device portal so that we can explore the features of our operating system now because your Windows 10 IoT core operating system is unlike your normal Windows 10 operating system that gives you a desktop environment where you can manage and configure a lot of things from there what you get instead with the windows 10 iit core is a device portal so it's an embedded web server that you can actually access for you to be able to manage and configure your device resources so in order to go to your device portal you can type in the ip address on your web browser and go to port 8080 or you could use your windows 10 iit core dashboard which i'm going to show you right now So as you can see now, our Raspberry Pi, my demo Pi, is already showing on a list of devices that are on my network. So if you right click on that device, you can see you get a lot of options. You can shut down your device straight from your IoT code dashboard. You can restart it and you can also open your device portal straight from the IoT code dashboard. So I'll go ahead and do that. Now this is where you enter the password that you assigned on setting up your device. The username is a default administrator. Then you can sign in. So this is the equivalent of your desktop on the Windows 10 RT Core. So here on the left, you can go into your apps and then you can go into your app manager. So your apps manager lists all of your apps that are currently installed on your Raspberry Pi and it shows you which ones are running and which ones are stopped. So what you are probably asking yourself right now is how do I get my application? Once I've, I've, I've loaded my application onto my Windows 10 IoT Core uh, operating system, how do I get it to run automatically without me having to start it? So this is where you can actually set up your application to run on startup. So as you can see here, we've got the IoT code default application that is set to run on startup. So when you build your application and deploy it onto your Windows 10 IoT code device, you will see your application show on this list here and then you can actually select it as a startup application. Now, this is also where you can actually perform some actions against an app. So if you want to start an app, you can do it here. And if you want to install an app, you can also do it here. And then you've also got your file explorer. And you also got some quick run samples, which are pre-built apps that you can run to test your device. And then you can also go to processes where you can actually monitor the performance of your device. And then we can also go into connectivity. So under connectivity, you've got your Bluetooth. So your Bluetooth is going to show you your paired devices. And it will also show you the devices that are available if you want to pay with certain devices via Bluetooth. And then you can also go into your network. It will show you your network adapters and you will also be able to see all the Wi-Fi networks that are available for you to connect. And then here you can also check to see if there are any updates available. So there's a lot of things that you can do here on your Windows device portal 
with regards to management of your Windows 10 analytical uh, device. So you can go ahead and explore the rest of the functionality here. So we've managed to install Windows 10 RT Core onto our SD card for the Raspberry Pi. And we've also managed to boot up our device and we have configured the operating system. So now we are ready to start building our IoT applications and deploy them onto our Windows 10 IoT Core device. Let us begin by taking a look at our Raspberry Pi graphic for input output mapping. Now in this demo, we want to blink a single LED, so we need to choose a GPIO pin that we will connect our LED to. We will use GPIO pin number 18. Now this is GPIO pin number 18 only in mapping, but on the actual board it is on position 12 as you can see from the graphic. So to connect up our LED, we are going to use a jumper cable. One end of the cable will be connected to GPIO pin 18, which is on position 12 on our board. And then on the other end, we'll connect a current limiting resistor to protect our LED. And then we'll connect the longer leg of our LED to the resistor because current flows into the LED through the longer leg. And then finally, we connect the shorter leg of the LED to the ground signal on my board, which in this case is on position 20. Now we are ready to write our code to blink the LED. But first, let me show you the actual connection that I have here. Okay, so on my setup here, I've got this brown jumper cable here connected to GPIO pin 18, which is the pin that we're going to be using to blink our LED. So I've got my pin number 6, GPIO pin 18, connected to one end of my resistor, my current limiting resistor. And then I've got my ground from the Raspberry Pi connected to the other end of the LED. Okay, now that we have wired up our hardware and connected the LED, we can then go ahead and start developing our software to blink the LED. So you start your Visual Studio. And then you go to create a new project. And then here we must look for the blank app universal windows C sharp. Select it and then click next. And then we can give our project a name. We'll call it blinking LED. And then here you can uh, click OK for your target version. OK, so our project has been successfully created. Now, because we're developing this for a Windows 10 IoT device, we need to add a reference. This reference is for the IoT extensions for the UWP. So make sure you check this box. As you can see, our extensions have been added to the references. Now let's go ahead and edit the code. Open your main page.xaml.cs. Now the first thing that you need to do is to add a namespace for the GPIO. And then after that, we can add a constant. Now here, we are declaring the variable LED with the GPIO pin number that we have connected our LED to. And then after that, I will paste the code here. Now, 
Now, this is a method that will enable us to blink the LED. Now what is happening in this method is that first of all we are creating a controller that checks to see if our board has got GPIO pins. If the board has got GPIO pins, what we are doing, we are opening the pin at number 18 and then we are setting that as an output. And then after that we have got a super loop that switches on and off the LED forever. So now we need to call this method on our initialization. Okay, now our code is ready. So now what we need to do, we need to select ARM here for our Raspberry Pi. And then we need to select remote machine. Now here we need to put the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. So let's navigate to our Windows 10 IoT code dashboard to see what our IP address is. So there is our IP address. Now you can see that our application is running. Okay, so we have successfully built and deployed our first Windows 10 RT core app, which is a blinking LED. So I've got my connection as shown in this diagram, whereby I'm using an HX711 load cell module whose purpose here is to amplify the voltage signal from the load cell, convert it into a 24-bit digital equivalent, and make it available through a two-wire serial interface. So to collect the weight value, I simply have to provide a clock signal and get the data bit by bit. Okay, so I've gone ahead and connected my load cell, my load cell module and the Raspberry Pi exactly the way I've just described. So let's head over to Visual Studio to develop our app to read the weight value from the load cell. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna need to do is to open Visual Studio and create a new project. Click on create a new project. Okay, and then we select a blank universal Windows app. And then we're gonna call this project read load cell. And then click create. Okay. Okay, so our project has been successfully created. Now, because we're going to be accessing the GPIO pins of the Pi, the first thing that we're gonna want to do is to add a reference that enables us to do that. So you right click on references, add a reference, and then under extensions, you select Windows IoT extensions for the UWP and click OK. And then we go ahead and open our main page to the C file. And then we go ahead and add the assembly reference for using our GPIO. Okay, and then next 
we want to be able to read the weight value from the load cell say every two seconds so we're gonna add a timer okay and then i'll go ahead and add the code for starting my timer here under initialization So here I'm actually adding a time span of two seconds. And then I'm specifying my sensor timer event angler. And then I'm starting the timer. Okay, and then let's go ahead and add our sensor timer event angler method. Okay, so inside this method, this is where we're going to put our routines for reading the weight value from the load cell. Okay, uh, so now I'll be clocking my HX711 module on GPIO pin number 23. This is going to be my clock line. So I'll declare the pin number. And then my data line is on pin 24. Okay, so now we've declared the pins that we're going to be using to get information out of our load cell module. And then we add this code to create our GPIO pins, which is the clock pin and data pin. Okay, so basically we've got two lines here. One of the line is going to be an input for reading data, and the other one is going to be an output that we're going to be using to send out a clock signal to initiate the data transfer into our raspberry pi so now we need to initialize these pins as such i'm going to call an initialization method here before we start our sensor and then i'll call it initialize gpio and then i'll add my initialization method here And then inside our initialization method, we create a new GPIO controller, which is basically a variable that returns to us the type of GPIO pins that are available on our target device. In this case, it's our Raspberry Pi. And then we check to see if our target device has got any GPIO pins at all. And if not, we return false which makes our return type here a boolean or else we use our GPIO pin controller to open the pin on the pin number specified by the clock pin number which is our number pin, pin GPIO pin number 23 here and then after opening our GPIO pin we use this method here to write a value of low to that GPIO pin, which is our clock pin, so that we default at zero, which is low. And then we set our GPIO pin as an output since we're going to be sending out the clock signal to our load cell module. And then we go on to initialize our data pin. Again, we use our GPIO controller to open the pin at the pin number specified by our data pin number, which is pin number 24. And then we set that pin as an input pin since we'll be reading in data from our module. And then I'll add the method for reading the actual data. So this is the method that does the actual reading of the load cell module. So what I'm doing here is that I'm creating an unsigned integer value to hold my value which is the 32 bit and then i'm also creating a byte array to hold the four individual bytes that make up the 32 bit uh, integer value and then i'm also checking to see if the load cell module is ready but by reading its data pin to see if it's low and then this is where i'm actually clocking the data and then storing it 
byte by byte so we're going to add a function to do the shifting in of bytes in a moment and then i'm also preparing my module for the next reading cycle and then and then here i'm masking the bits to pad out my integer value and then i'm using the individual bytes to construct my 32-bit integer value and then according to the data sheet that value comes as a two's complement so i need to flip all the bits and then i retain my integer value and then now i'll add the code for shifting in the data so here i'm providing a clock signal and reading the data bit by bit shifting it until it forms a byte and then retaining that value until we get all the four bytes that make up our 32 bit and then we mask the 24 bit out of that value okay and then here on our timer we can then call the method to to read the sensor data and put it into our integer value So now obviously this is a, this is a raw value it doesn't really uh, mean anything it's, a, it's just a conversion of an analog signal into a digital signal so you need to do uh, a load cell calibration to actually get the actual value of your weight so you're going to be using uh, this equation of a straight line y equals to mx plus c but that's a whole different topic altogether so what i'll do is i'll go ahead and do the calibration and then I'll come in and, and, and put the, the resulting equation here. Okay, so I've gone ahead and run this application just to get the raw values using my 2 kg weight so that I can uh, calculate and come up with the, an equation that uh, represents the, the linear response of the, of the load cell. So basically, this is uh, what I've got here. Okay, so we've got our value, so I'll quickly go to my main page to demo so that we can create a text block to display our weight value. Okay, so I'll simply go to my toolbox and then I'll grab my text block. And then I'll adjust the size of the font. And then I'll give it a name. Okay, I'll go back to my C sharp file. And then display. My weight value is a string. Okay, so I'll just confirm the IP address of my device. And then just make sure it's the same one here. Okay, looks good. And then I can deploy my solution. Okay, so my application is running and then you can see on the display there uh, is currently zero because there's nothing on the scale and then if I start to put some weight objects there you can see the weight changing so you see my calibration is spot on it's two kgs and then if I add some other items you can see the weight changing so obviously we've got a two second delay of getting the weight Okay, so we've successfully built our Windows 10 IoT Core app for reading load cell data. Okay, so this is the connection that I have here. I've got my load cell module connected to this uh, weighing indicator here. And then I've got the Raspberry Pi connected to the serial port of this weighing indicator uh, through this Max 3232 level converter. 
So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to build a Windows 10 IoT Core app that will be reading the weight data from this weighing indicator using RS232 protocol. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is to create a new project. And then we select a blank app, Universal Windows. And then we'll call our project read RS232. Click create. Okay. And then when our UWP app is finished creating, we go ahead and add our Windows IoT extension. And then you go to extensions, select Windows IoT extensions for the UWP, click OK. OK, so we've added our IoT extensions. Now, because Windows 10 IoT Core is not a full operating system, it doesn't like straight out of the box give us access to the uh, serial port. So what we need to do we need to add the capabilities for accessing the serial port. So to do that, we go to our app manifest. Just right click, view code. And then you scroll down here. And then we add this device capability for serial port communication. Okay, and then now we go to our main C -sharp file. And then here we create our serial device and we call it serial port. And then we create our objects for reading and writing to the serial port. And then we create our cancellation token. And then we come down here on the initialization of our app, we initialize our serial port. And then I'll add the method for initializing the UART. And then here put the method for the actual UART configuration. So basically here I'm getting all the available serial ports and then assigning the first one to my serial port device that I initialized earlier and then I set my serial settings and then I listen on the port so I'll go ahead and add the method for listening. Okay so this is my method for listening on the serial port. So basically I'm creating a super loop here. And then inside that super loop, I'm calling a method to do the actual reading of the port. So I'll go ahead and add that. So here is where the actual reading takes place. So here I'll put some initialization code for my read buffer length cancellation and also pointing my reader object to the serial port input stream. And then we follow with our code for launching the read task and then we wait and then if we've got bytes to read from our buffer I'll create a new byte array and read the bytes into that array and then we need to declare that array and then based on the data sheet of my indicator I need to check to see if this data is coming in the correct format. And then if it is, I'll call my method to sort through this data to extract the weight. And then I'll put my method here. And 
and then we declare the variable for holding our display weight and then I need to add the method for closing the serial port and then now we want to be able to display this weight so I'll go to my main page to demo and then here I'll add a text block on the interface to display the weight And then I'll call this the weight text block. And then we go back to our C sharp file. And then we're going to add the code for displaying the weight on our text block. And then we deploy our solution. And then when I put my weights on, you can see that uh, we're successfully reading the weight from the weighing indicator, even though my calibration is off. So what I have here is this industrial controller from Opti22. So I've got this potentiometer mapped to a Modbus address that will be reading using the Raspberry Pi. And then here I've got this DHT11 sensor module that measures temperature and humidity and communicates using a one-wire protocol. So I will also be reading those values using the Raspberry Pi. At the end of this demo, we'll have an app that graphically shows the value of temperature and humidity from our DHT11 sensor and our Modbus TCP value from the industrial controller as you can see on the display. Okay, let's create a blank universal windows project. Now our project has been created. We'll begin by connecting to our industrial controller to read the potentiometer Modbus address using Modbus TCP. And to do that, we must first install a package for Modbus communication particularly for Universal Windows app. Okay, so that's done. Now let's go to our main page C -sharp file, which is the code that first executes when our app starts running. Now I want our app to read sensor data every second, so I'll create a timer. And then on initialization, I'll specify the one second time span for my timer, specify a method for angling the timer, and then start the timer. And then I'll put my timer method here. Now for my Modbus communication, I'll first include the necessary assembly reference, and then I declare my variables. I've got my input data, my controller slave address, my TCP client master, and the Modbus data for storing the conversion from weight to float and my variable for the result. And then here I'll put my method for connecting to the Modbus client. So here I'm creating a client with the IP address of my controller and a port 502. And then here I'm creating the Modbus master, which is my Raspberry Pi. And then I'll call my connect method here on initialization and then I'll put my method for reading Modbus and then another one for converting the two bytes of Modbus into a float and then when that is done I'll call the read Modbus method every second now that's all for our Modbus we move on to our DHT11 sensor module First of all, we must include the package that allows us to talk to the sensor module uh, via its one-wire protocol. Okay, so we've got our package installed. Now we go back to our C-sharp file. 
and then here we add the assemble reference for our sensor module and the GPIO pins of the Pi and then we go on to add the variables for communicating with my DHT11 uh, sensor module so here I've got that one wire connected to pin number 4 GPIO pin number 4 of the Pi and then here I'm instantiating a type of DHT and then I'm also instantiating a GPIO pin type and then uh, we also need to initialize the DHT11 sensor by opening the pin number 4 and then setting it as an input pin and then we put the method that does the actual reading of the temperature and humidity data and then finally we also call the sensor method after every one second now we have all the code required to read Modbus and sensor data but then we need to be able to visualize it graphically so we go to our XAML page now our project comes with standard controls such as your buttons and stuff but if we need dashboard controls such as the radial gauge we want to use we must add a UI package and then when that is complete we reference that package on our XAML page and then I add this code here which is basically I'm creating a grid with three columns and two rows and then in the first row I'm putting my three radial gauges and then in the second row I'm putting the labels and then finally I go back to my C-sharp code to include the code for updating these radial gauges and then from here I make sure that ARM processor is selected and remote machine is selected here and then confirm the IP address of my Raspberry Pi and then I deploy okay so as you can see our app is running so I will turn the potentiometer up and uh, breathe into the sensor module Okay, so this is the hardware setup that I have here where my Raspberry Pi at the back of this display is connected to this DHT11 temperature and humidity sensor. So we're going to be reading the data from that sensor and storing it on a SQLite database. Okay, so I've got this uh, very simple app from a previous video. So what's happening here is that I'm using a timer to read a DHT11 sensor after every two seconds and then store the temperature and humidity values in these uh, global variables so we're going to go ahead and add our SQLite database to this application so the first thing that we need to do is to add an interface so so we're going to do that by adding a new class library that's going to act as our data access layer And then you select a .NET standard class library and we're going to call it data access layer click create so I'm just going to delete this class here and then we're going to create a new class on our data access layer And then we're going to call it data access okay now we need to add the SQLite package to our solution so you right click your solution and go to manage NuGet packages we go to browse And then we install for both projects click ok accept 
and then we install the Microsoft Data SQLite Core. Okay, and then we install another package that will let us use the Windows version of SQLite. This one we install it only for our main project. Okay, so we finished installing all the required packages. Now the next step for us would be to reference the data access layer on our main project so that we can gain access to it from our main project. Okay, now that we've done that, let's go to our data access class to add our code for accessing the SQLite database. And then we add reference to our SQLite package. And then we're also going to be using lists to store our data. Okay, and then we go ahead and add the method for initializing our SQLite database. So basically this code, what it does is it creates a new database called SQLite telemetry and then create checks to see if a table exists called telemetry table. If not, it will create that and then it will include a column for humidity and temperature. Okay, and then from there, we put our method for saving our telemetry data on our SQLite database. So basically what is happening here is that this method accepts two arguments, the humidity and temperature. And then it opens a connection to the database, creates a command for storing the humidity and temperature onto our database. And then it uses those arguments as parameters to store into the database. And then finally, let's add the method for retrieving our telemetry data from the SQLite database. Okay, so our method returns a list of telemetry data and our telemetry data type comprises of the humidity and temperature and we'll be creating it in a moment. So here we're opening a connection to our SQLite database. We're selecting everything from telemetry table and then we are looping through every entry on the database and storing it onto our list here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and add our class for our telemetry data, data type. And then our telemetry data, data type will comprise of humidity and temperature. So we go back to our data access and then we must declare our list of type telemetry data. And then here we must make our telemetry data class public. Okay, and then now we go back to our main C sharp file. And then here we must include reference to our data access layer. And then here, after reading our sensor value, we want to record that data in our SQLite database. So we add data use our data access class to edit the data. Okay, but then now we don't want to start recording right away. We want to, to, to have a button that we can click to start recording. So,
put this under our if statement. And then we declare our flag for starting to record. And then we initialize it to false. Okay, and then we'll go to our main page.zemu to put the HMI for, for, for initiating the recording and viewing our recorded data. And then I'll just copy this. So on this HMI, I've basically I've got three columns, one with the buttons for starting and viewing the records, another one for temperature data, and another one for humidity data. So as you can see, it will only be displaying five records at any given time. So I'll go ahead and add an event angler for start recording button click. And then I'll also add an event angler for view records button click. So if the start recording button is clicked, we enable recording. And then when the view records button is clicked, we use our data access to get the data from the SQLite database. We put it into a list. And then we'll populate our temperature and humidity text boxes. So I'll just go ahead and declare this list. Okay, so our app is ready to okay, so our app is ready to deploy. Let's check to see if our Raspberry Pi is online. It is, and then let's confirm that we are pointing to the right device here. Okay, and then we can go ahead and deploy. Okay, so our app is running now. So if we go and view record there, you see we've got no records yet uh, because we haven't enabled recording yet. So we go ahead and enable recording. And then if we go and check view records, you see we've got two records because we're recording after every two seconds. And then we've got all the records coming through now. Okay, so this is the setup that I have here. I've got my Raspberry Pi that is running a UWP application generating telemetry data from this temperature and humidity sensor via its one wire protocol and also from this potentiometer via the Modbus TCP protocol. Okay, so let us begin by creating our database and preparing our SQL Server instance to accept remote connections. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is to change our SQL Server authentication to mixed mode. And then we create our database And then add a new login. And then from here, we must give our user the permission to write to the database. And we set it as DB owner. And then we create a table for storing our sensor data. So here is our temperature data with a decimal data type, humidity, and our Modbus data. And then we let SQL Server generate the date time by default. Okay, so we've successfully created our database. And then the next step is to configure SQL Server to accept remote connections. Close the management studio and open the SQL Server configuration manager. 
and then under SQL Server Network Configuration, select Protocols for SQL Server Express, and then make sure that TCP IP is enabled. And then right click TCP IP and select Properties, select IP Addresses, and then scroll down to IP All. Make sure TCP Dynamic Ports is blank and then set your TCP port to 1433. Apply. And then restart your SQL Server service. Okay, so we already have our UWP app that is basically uh, generating telemetry data from Modbus and temperature and humidity sensors. So we are going to send that data to our remote SQL Server database. Now, because Windows 10 IoT Core is not a full OS, it doesn't automatically have access to some resources, so we must enable necessary capabilities to communicate with an external enterprise application, such as SQL Server. Okay, and then from here, we go to our c -sharp file, and then I'll put these declarations here. So here I'm creating a new SQL uh, Server connection, and then here I'm building my connection string. And then from there, I'll add my method for locking the data to the SQL Server, creating a new SQL command, and then executing it. And then here, right after generating my telemetry data, I call the method to log that data to the SQL Server. And then here on my database, I'll execute a quick query. So my table is currently empty. Okay, and then I deploy. And then now, if I select everything from sensor data, you can see our sensor data coming through. So you see our Modbus data is at 29. If I turn down the port, we're now getting 21. Now, if I want my data sent to a cloud-based server instead, I'll go to my Azure portal, SQL databases, and then I create a new SQL database. Okay, my server has been successfully deployed, so I'll go to the resource. So I'll get my database connection strings, copy it, and then I'll go to my set server firewall to allow my internet gateway device to connect to the server on the cloud so that I can connect my Raspberry Pi and my PC to the server on the cloud. And then I go back to my SQL Server Management Studio to connect to the database in the cloud. So I've successfully connected to my SQL Server database in the cloud. And then from here, I go into my demo DB in the cloud. And then I create my sensor data table. And then I go back to my UWP application to update my connection string. And then I deploy. And then we go to SQL Server Management Studio to see if our data is going to our database in the cloud. And there, we've got our data going into our SQL Server database in the cloud. Okay, so I've got my Raspberry Pi here that is reading the potentiometer value from this industrial controller using Modbus TCP. So what I want to do is to use the Raspberry Pi as an MQTT client to publish an MQTT message to a broker in the cloud based on the position of this potentiometer. And then I'll have my Epic controller here Subscribe to that topic in the cloud as an MQTT client and switch on this light when it receives the message published by the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so in order for us to be able to use MQTT in our Windows 10 IoT Core application, we must first install the package that enables us to do that. And then when the installation is complete, we go to our c -sharp file. And then we'll add the necessary assembly reference. And then after that, I'll add my method for sending the MQTT message. Okay, so basically what I'm doing here 
is that I'm creating a new MQTT client using these two instructions here. And then this instruction here is for putting the options for your MQTT broker. And here we'll be putting the URL and port number of our broker in the cloud. And then this instruction here is to connect to the broker. So this here is my message builder. I'm using the topic Raspberry Pi MQTT demo slash set point. And then I'm sending a payload of one or true, which is what you're going to be using to switch on the light on the Epic controller. And then finally, I publish my message. Now for my cloud broker, I'm going to be using the Hive MQ public MQTT broker. So if you navigate to this URL here, and then you scroll down, and then you can get your broker URL here. And then you put it here. And then you can optionally specify your port. Okay, so we've got our method for sending MQTT messages set up now. And then here on my Epic controller, I'm simply running a node red flow that subscribes to the same topic on the Hive MQ broker. And then it sends that payload to the digital output of the controller. So if it's a one, it will switch it on. If it's a zero, it will remain off. And then I deploy. So now we go to our method for reading Modbus data. And then here we say if the Modbus result is greater than 25, we send an MQTT message. Okay, so that is now let's run our application. Now, if I turn up my port to be above 25%, we should see the light come on. There we go. Now, instead of using the cloud as the MQTT broker, we can actually have our Raspberry Pi run as the broker. Now, to do that, I'll add my server method here. So basically here I'm specifying the port number for my server and then I'm creating the MQTT server and then this basically is a routine that is performed when a message is received and then this is what is performed when a connection is detected and then I'll start my MQTT server here and then I'll just start my server on initialization And then I'll just point the MQTT client on my Epic controller to the Raspberry Pi instead of the cloud. And then we can use an MQTT client like MQTT.fx to send our message. And then we publish the message. So the basic architecture here is that data collection and the generation of telemetry data is performed here by my Raspberry Pi. And using MQTT, it is sent to the cloud via the cloud gateway, Azure IoT Hub, which manages bi-directional communication. And then from the IoT Hub, it goes into the Azure Time Series Insights, where it is indexed and stored. Okay, so I've got a UWP application from a previous video running on this Raspberry Pi and collecting temperature and humidity data from this sensor. And then I'm also reading the value of this potentiometer via the Modbus TCP. So we'll be sending this telemetry data to the Azure Time Series Insights. Okay, so I'm in my Azure portal. So I'm going to begin by creating the Azure IoT Hub by going to create a resource. Internet of Things, RT Hub. And then here I'm going to select a resource group to put my RT Hub. Then I'm going to give my RT Hub a name. Okay, so the deployment is complete. So I'll go to the RT Hub that we've just created. And then here I'll go to the built in endpoints. 
and then here under events i'm going to create a new consumer group specifically dedicated for the azure time series insights now that is to make sure that we don't have conflicts with other services that may be wanting to consume the events of the IIT hub okay and then from here i go to my shared access policies to copy my connection string that we're going to use later on to send telemetry data to the azure iot hub okay and then from here i'm gonna go and create my azure time series insights environment and then I go ahead and fill in the details from my time series insights environment. Okay, so now we've finished setting up our Azure time series insights environment. So now we go to our device that will be sending the telemetry data to the Azure IoT Hub, which is my Raspberry Pi here. Now, to be able to send data to the Azure IoT Hub from an edge device, we need to install an SDK, a device SDK that will allow us to communicate with the Azure IoT Hub. Okay, so when that is done, go back to my C file. Then I add the assemble reference. And then I add the declarations. So here I'm instantiating a new device client. This is my IoT Hub URI, and this is my device key. I go to the initialization, then initialize my device, and set the transport type as MQTT. Okay, so now that we've successfully created our device, we then want to send the telemetry data to the cloud using the IoT Hub. So here, essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a JSON object uh, with the properties of device ID, temperature data, humidity data, modbus data. And then I'm using this method to serialize the object and then encoding the message string. Our method has to be asynchronous. Okay, so now we're ready to deploy our solution. Okay, now, so let's go into our Azure Time Series Insights environment to check to see if we're receiving any telemetry data at all so what i've done is i've left this running for a while so that you can get uh, a sizable amount of data so you can see here we've got the data that has been coming through and then we can filter to see what has been going on in the last four hours and then we can see what has been happening in the past 30 minutes so there are many ways of digging through this time series data that is stored in Azure Time Series Insights. The most convenient to use is the Time Series Insights Explorer. So here I can view my time series data in the form of a chart, a heat map, or a table. And then I can specify the telemetry data point that I want to view. And I can split that data via the device ID and then if there's a certain section that interests me, I can select that section to explore the events in detail. So you see here we had a slight dip at 1838. And then you can also adjust the size of your interval to zoom in or zoom out from your time series data. So under the tabular format here, you can actually download the CSV file of the data and perhaps use it to train a machine learning model. Now, the nice thing is that you can easily integrate time series insights into your own custom applications using JavaScript libraries. There are pre-built JavaScript samples that you can customize to create analytics dashboard for your applications. On this one here, you can create bar charts and pie charts straight from your line charts. And then on this one here, you can put markers to your telemetry data to compare values from different times. And you can visualize how your column chart change as you slide through time. And the same thing for your pie charts. Now all this simple code and more for integrating time series insights into your own application is available on GitHub. 
So as you can see, this is a really powerful way of storing and analyzing your time series data.